Welcome to PhD with Women on It, Hack the Future. My name is Beata Young and today's PhD Positivity Hacks Delivered guest will be Shelley Lombard. Topic from Wall Street Wiz to Relationship Building Innovator. Episode 140 Two starts here. Let me remind you, this is a grassroots community that focuses on women on IT, an inclusive forum of women in technology, startup and female leaders who are supported by men as well. And I bring heart to that hustle because empathy is my mojo. And empathy is critical when you're building your relationship. First, let me mention a couple of great stories to share with our community today. Cheers to our former PhD guest, Bella Barchwell, and her company, Stellify, for turning two today. Wishing you and your company continued success. Congratulations to Krista Kim, founder of O Studio AI and former PhD guest on her new collection, Continuum with Taex. Your passion, Krista, and dedication are sure to inspire many. A round of applause to the five new laureates of the 2024 Four Women in Science International Awards organized by UNESCO and found Foundation L'Oreal. Congratulations to Professor Nieng Yang, Professor Genevieve Almozi, and Professor Alicia Kowaltowski, and many more. Keep inspiring us. Now let's go back to our topic from Wall Street Wiz to relationship building innovator. Well, to talk about that, I need to go through a lengthy description uh, prepared for my husband. But, however, I would like to remind you that Shelley today is joining us from where? From uh, right outside of New York City, right outside of Manhattan. Well, Shelley, thank you so much for joining us. Um, well, I wanted to talk about a relationship, how it can close the gap between where you are in your career and where you want to be. Why this topic of your, um, your discussion? Why did you want to talk about relationship building? Yeah, so in business, so I think most of us realize that in our personal lives, relationships are everything. You want to have good relationships with your family, with your friends. And, um, you know, those relationships can actually help you live longer, according to studies. But in business also, relationships are everything. And I think most people realize that. Um, for women who tend to be very good at um personal relationships, um, relationships or business relationships are kind of a hack for your career. Because as you said, in our, what we say at Schmooze, the company that I started, is that business relationships can help you close the gap, um, gaps in your career between where you are and where you want to be. And where you want to be could be a promotion, it could be the C-suite, it could be a pivot in your career, a career change, it could be a board of directors role, which a lot of women are looking at now, and relationships are really a hack to getting that those things that you want, those goals. Mm. So we want to unlock the power of network and uh, really we want to skyrocket uh, your career. Uh, so we want to make sure that today's discussion focuses on these uh, topics that are pivotal to many uh, future acquisitions or whatever, whatever it, may, it may happen. Because as we know from previous discussion with Kelly Howie, we uh, need to build our network because your network has a network and net worth. Now, um, Shelley, you are, you've been working on uh, Wall Street. Can you tell us about your career? How did you build your network there? 
Yeah, so I uh, worked on Wall Street for about 30 years. Um, my specialty was investing in companies that needed to be turned around, what people call distressed investing or vulture investing. So these are companies that either needed to, to be turned around, their business needed to be turned around, or else they had too much debt and the, the balance sheet needed to be restructured. And I was a good networker, but I was never very intentional about it. It was kind of like, oh, I like that person, let's have lunch. You know, it wasn't like I was going out and seeking to build relationships. And I think, you know, when people think of networking, they think of going somewhere and meeting people and do the whole, you know, either exchange business cards or now exchange, you know, connect on LinkedIn. But it's really about building relationships and maintaining those relationships. And I think I would have been a lot more successful on Wall Street if I had been more intentional about building relationships and maintaining relationships with people that I had met along the way. Um, at one point in my career, I wanted to change what I was doing and leave Wall Street and do something related, but not the same thing. I was tired of the grind. I was tired of the stress, but I had let my network or my relationships just die. I'd been working from home. I'd been raising kids. I had moved to the suburbs. And so headhunters or executive recruiters will call you for jobs that you used to do. They don't know what you want to do in the future, and they are not going to call you for something that you want to switch to. And so that's when you need your own network. And then the second time that I realized that network and relationship building was so important, after I left Wall Street, I started serving on corporate boards. So I was on the board of Bed Bath & Beyond, for example. That was a company that needed to be turned around. We, you know, ended up not being able to turn it around. We sold our assets to overstock.com. But 80% of corporate board roles are found through relationships, not through headhunters, not through any other means, but through relationships. And that's why men hold so many of them. Um, I think there's a new campaign by uh, Elf Cosmetics, which talks about how there are more men named Richard on corporate boards than they are, you know, women of, you know, of color or, uh, you know, et cetera. And so the reason is that men really focus on those relationships and they don't worry about being transactional. They'll call each other and say, hey, you know, you, you have any board roles? I'm interested. And women are a little bit hesitant to be transactional. Um, you know, we, we're much more interested in being, you know, genuine and I'm not going to connect with anybody that I don't really like and that kind of thing. And so with board roles, most of them are held by men. And so for women to crack that, we need to be more relationship driven. And, you know, it's not just about, you know, do I like you? It's uh, one woman said to me, you know, men connect based on what they can do for each other. Women connect based on whether they like each other or not. And so I'm not saying connect with people you, you absolutely don't like, because I don't, but there's so many nice people out there. You can build a nice, deep, intentional uh, group or network of business relationships connecting with good, decent people. Mm. Well, it sounds a bit um, manipulative in a way. Uh, of course, uh, we, as you mentioned, we like to build uh, relationships that are real rather than have uh, something that is not, that doesn't feel quite right because uh, we may not really be capable of having a discussion with this person outside of the work professional uh, world. Uh, however, what do you mean by being intentional? Uh, how do you build this relationship so it still feels realistic and, and feels good and feels that it's nothing manipulative in, in that uh, attitude towards the other person. Yeah, so what I would say is relationships are built on reciprocity. So if I feel like I can't 
um, give anything to the relationship. So it's not just about what I can get out of it, but if you call me and you need to be connected to someone in my network, uh, someone I know, if you need a piece of information, I want to be ready to give that. So it's not manipulative if it's a two-way street. It's only manipulative if you constantly ask them to give you information or give you contacts or connect you and you're not willing to do the same. Anybody in my network, you put it this way, if I'm not willing to do that for you, then you're not in my network. So in other words, if we don't like each other well enough that you can you know, send me a LinkedIn message and say, hey, I notice you're connected to so-and-so, are you willing to connect me? If I'm not willing to do that for you, then I, you know, you're not really, quote unquote, in my network. I have a network of people who I may not even have met all of them, but we maybe have had coffee on LinkedIn. We po- we share each other's posts. I like their posts. We have kind of a LinkedIn relationship. And so those relationships are built on reciprocity. And so I talk probably at least three times a week to women who reach out to me who I don't know, but who will you know want to know about getting on boards. And so I will spend half an hour with them talking to them. I don't expect anything out of them, out of that relationship, but now they're part of my network. And many of them are sophisticated or generous enough to say to me, how can I help you? So it's not manipulative if you are willing to reciprocate. And that's what network, just like any relationship, it's built on reciprocity. And so I wouldn't have anybody in my network that I'm like, "Mm, I don't really like them. And so if they called me, I don't want to refer them to anybody. I may know them. They may be a contact, but I wouldn't really consider them part of my network. Mm. Can you share a pivotal moment uh, from your early career that taught you the importance of building strong relationship in the finance industry? Yeah. So, you know, as I was saying, I went through a period I had been, um, I worked from home before work from home was even a thing. Um, This was back in kind of 2003, 2004, but this was a company where all the analysts worked from home. And I took this job because they allowed me to work from home. And um, I was raising kids. I think my kids were in middle school and elementary school. Um, I lived in the suburbs, so the commute was a bit of a, a chore. And so I took this job, but I, like many working moms, got caught up in, you know, my kids' activities. You know, my son played soccer, travel soccer at a very high level. So we would travel from, you know, the New York area to California. We were in North Carolina. My daughter was a dancer. Um, I was driving her all around, you know, the the, the local area to different dance events. And um, I basically let all of my contacts die. Um, you know, and so I, um, when I decided that this job, which was very, very stressful, um, because again, I was covering companies or looking at or analyzing companies that were in financial trouble. I specialized in the automotive sector. So I was, um, our clients were looking to me to make recommendations about things like General Motors. I don't know, many of you are probably too young to remember when General Motors went into bank bankruptcy, but our clients would call us and say, hey, um, you know, should I buy bonds? Should I stay away from them? Should I sell bonds? So it was a very, very stressful job. And when I woke up between working from home in the suburbs, you know, dealing with my kids who I adore and this stressful job, my network had just disappeared. So after that job ended, I was like, I want to do something different, adjacent, but different. And I just couldn't break in because I had a handful of people I had kept in touch with, but not that many people. And so I realized then how important relationships are. I ended up making my way to a corporate board. And the way I got my first corporate board position was through a relationship with an investor. So I, it was probably later in my career, 30 years in, 25 years in, when I realized it hit me the value of relationships and how I should do a better job keeping in touch with people I like, not with people I hate, but keeping in touch with people I like. And there were a lot of them. Mm. 
Fantastic story. Thank you so much. Uh, we have Rebecca Balami the Robos, KAPM. Uh, that company was way ahead of its time. Thank you so much, Rebecca, for watching yes, and cheering. They were. <laughs> uh -huh. Cheering us today. Um, please, uh, everybody else, leave us a little comment, a little heart, whatever you can share with us today because it is helping our community to shine the light and also schmooze as uh, Shelly says um, and make sure that there is more people aware of the problem of being a networker. Now, uh, we talked about your career uh, at, um, at Wall Street. Uh, as somebody who has transitioned from a successful career on Wall Street to serving on corporate boards, including Bed Bath & Beyond, what role have relationships played in your ability to navigate and thrive in these different professional spheres? Yeah, uh, it's played a major role. So um, I do a lot of panels. I speak on a lot of panels about how women can get on boards. I'm speaking on one this afternoon in about an hour or two. And um, I, um, I always say it's relationships, relationships, relationships. Like I said, 80% of corporate board roles are found through relationships. So I do talk to headhunters. I do, um, you know, put my name in databases, but I've been on six corporate boards and every single one of those corporate board roles has been the result of a relationship. Somebody who knew me and asked me if I would be interested. So my first board was with an investor I had known for 30-ish years. Um, we invested in distressed situations together. He said to me, you know, I have an equity stake in a company. Would you be interested in being on the board? At that time, I didn't even aspire to being on boards, but um, I was at least savvy enough to say yes, and I did. Um, on that board, I met someone who asked me about being on a second board. On that board, I met someone who introduced me to someone. That's how I ended up on the Bed Bath & Beyond board and a board that I recently joined about you know six weeks ago. So relationships have been everything for me, in, in especially in creating what women are calling now a portfolio career, where you don't just have a you know regular, I hate to say nine to five, because at this level, none of us work nine to five, but you don't have like a full-time job. You might do a corporate board, a couple of boards, you might do some speaking, you might do some of this. And so all of those um, kinds of opportunities tend to come to you through relationships. Mm -hmm. So Schmooze offers many masterclasses in networking and hosts events to designed, designed to empower professional women in building their networks. So what inspired you to create it and how do you envision it closing the gap between women's current positions and their career aspirations? Yeah, so when I worked on Wall Street, um, I worked at Chase Manhattan at one job. Now it's, um, you know, JP Morgan Chase, but we always had um, tickets to events and you could take clients. So we had Knicks tickets, go Knicks. We had Knicks tickets. We had, you know, Giants tickets. Uh, the guys would take other people to, to take other guys to play golf. And what I will say is I think men realize, and it's just a truth, relationships are built through shared experiences. When I hang out with you, then I feel like we have a relationship. So I first started Schmooze to just offer different types of uh, events that women could invite clients, they could invite contacts, they can invite colleagues, they could invite mentors or mentees to these events, a shared experience. Uh, but what women started to tell me, and for example, I talked to somebody a couple of maybe a week ago who said to me, I'm an attorney, I'm not loving my current job. Um, and I realized that I want to move on, but I haven't paid any attention to my network. Um, I interviewed, I also have a, a schmooze newsletter. It's a LinkedIn newsletter. It's free. And uh, I talked to someone who said, my parents were from the Caribbean and their view was, you're not at work to make friends. You are at work to uh, do your work. 
that's how you, you know, you get ahead. And I realized I was missing relationships. So um, I felt like women not only needed events to bring people to, that some of us, and I put myself in that category, um, needed um, help many masterclasses on how to do this. So I met someone on LinkedIn. How do I turn that into an in real life relationship? I work from home three days a week. How do I continue to be visible internally when I'm working from home? How do I, you know, I ask somebody for coffee. I don't really know them that well. I want them to be my sponsor or my mentor at work. How do I promote myself in this conversation without being obnoxious? So these are 20 minute classes, three actionable takeaways that you can use to get to the point where you want to start taking people to events and our events. I'm a sports fanatic, so I love sports events, but we also have events like coffee tastings, spirit tastings, uh, manicures, massages, and margaritas. I think we're going to go to an NBA game, a WNBA game uh, this season together. Um, and so there are events that you can use to build a shared relationship with a contact, a colleague, a mentor, a mentee, a client. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we've got quite a good network of people here uh, leaving comments. Thank you so much. Grace Foden Curry says, Shelly, your story is an inspiration. Tyra L. Orange says, say yes, you and Shonda Rhimes. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There must be some shared experiences here. Um, now, I'll be of it in Patrick's opinion. That will be my husband. Good point on entertainment. <laughs> Great thing about schmooze is the narrowness of classic broker focus for inflated ball chasing. <laughs> Hashtag boring to me and thus bad for a career unless you fake football <laughs> enthusiasm. Indeed, uh, how can you fake enthusiasm in something you're not so enthusiastic where your other person that may get you career step uh, may be ranting too much about um, how do we not hurt their feelings but move into more interesting topic to stay ahead or on top of the discussion yeah so I think um, one of the things I do like about schmooze events, and I think it's one reason that uh, guys play golf and they take people to sports events, is because it's easy to bond over that. So I am a shy introvert. Most people do not uh, believe me when I say that, but I am absolutely a shy introvert. So probably one reason I hesitated to, you know, like try to follow up on relationships. For example, I work with someone who is now the CEO of a, you know, a big bank. Um, you know, I never even thought to keep in touch with him. Well, one reason I probably did was you know, if I invite him to coffee or for a drink, what the heck am I going to talk about? Now I got to talk to him. And so a shy introvert, that's the kind of pressure that you don't want. And so schmooze events are kind of designed to be like the coffee tasting. There's a barista that's talking about the three different single origin coffees that we're featuring and there are other people. So it's a little bit of, um, you know, you're not there to necessarily network with the other people. You're there to bond with the person that you came with, but you can network work with the other people. And you can talk to the barista, the manicures, massages, and margaritas. You can get a manicure together. You can both get massages. You can drink margaritas. So it little bit takes off the pressure for people like me who are like, okay, I invited them for a drink. Now what do I talk about? Um, and so that's kind of, um, I designed them to be, and amazingly enough, more people are uncomfortable with networking than you would think. I think probably most of us identify as being introverts. Uh, very few people, I think, are real extroverts. And so for us introverts, the schmooze, you know, events are, are helpful. Mm. The schmooze events are helpful. Sharing experience online is also helpful because we have got some discussion, heated discussion going on. Catherine Gacard says, love the schmooze newsletter. Thank you, Shelley, for your great content and advice. <laughs> and Rebecca Bellamy adds, I don't drink, but I do love coffee. 
So do I, Rebecca. So schmooze, coffee events are great. Well, hopefully I'll have a privilege to join that event sometime in the future and meet Absolutely. all your lovely ladies. Um, now, for shared experience and shy and introvert, that's quite a big step to organize events for networking. How did you break the mode of shyness? You know what? I haven't. So I have to tell you, LinkedIn is an amazing platform for people like me. I meet so many people on LinkedIn. And then it's just an easy next step to say, hey, I'm having this event. And they can either say yes or they can say no. But it's very, it's a lot easier than connecting in other ways. So what I would say is shy introverts, in, uh, um, LinkedIn is a gift. Uh, so take advantage of it. And it also, I'm not at this point opposed to, you know, I'll reach out to people I've never met and just say, you know, um, I am, you know, I saw your profile or I saw your, you know, your post and I'd love to get to know you. And then these days, uh, not only is LinkedIn uh, a godsend, but also Zoom and you can do a virtual coffee on Zoom. But again, you know, once you establish that LinkedIn contact, uh, contact, you can take it to the next level with an event where you say, okay, we did a virtual meetup, a virtual coffee on Zoom. Now let's do some something else. And then that person turns into a, what I call an IRL contact, an in real life contact, because you've actually met them. So this evening, for instance, I'm going into Manhattan to meet with somebody who saw a post that I did, or maybe I saw her post. It might've been either one. And we connected on LinkedIn and we've had, um, you know, a, a Zoom meetup. And now I'm going into Manhattan and we're going to share a quick bite to eat. Fantastic. Um, it's as simple as that. You just share content, you comment on each other's content, and you ask them for a coffee or a bite or whatever it might be. And here is Patrick says, coffee tasting, no key, not kickball, yay, please, and so much more conductive to chatting, networking. Indeed, and uh, there are so many great places to go to, whether it's a gallery, whatever uh, really you fancy. That's a great opportunity to network. Shelley, you emphasize the importance of genuine connections in networking. Can you share a personal experience where authenticity and strategic networking intersect to create a mutually beneficial opportunity or partnership? Yes. So, for example, I saw, um, I read an article uh, on self-promotion, which is something that women struggle with. I certainly struggle with and we get dinged for it. You know, men are expected to promote themselves and women are not expected. You know, I, you know, sometimes I've been in situations where I kind of felt like the men in the room thought I was overbearing because I hesitated and, and I, I'm sorry, because I said something about myself and they immediately felt like, oh, okay, she's, you know, being just way too assertive or really uh, aggressive, you know. Um, but I read an article about by someone, I think it was in Forbes, by someone who um, is um, a coach on self-promotion. And so I just reached out to her in LinkedIn and I said, I, I love this. This is, you know, excellent advice on how women can promote themselves without being obnoxious. And so she, um, you know, connect, re reconnected. And then I asked her if she would be a panelist on, uh, Schmooze did a panel on self-promotion. And she did. It was a panel. She was virtual from uh, Toronto, Canada. The rest of the panelists in the room were live. And it was, uh, you could attend in person or you could, you know, uh, tune in on, on Zoom. She did that. She was excellent. And so now I've asked her to teach a mini masterclass for schmooze. So when you have that coffee, so you met someone or say like me, it was somebody I worked with who we worked together a year ago and I'm like, hey, want to stay in touch? Want to catch up? What are you up to? Let's have a drink. What do I say 
to promote myself because I'm not there just to promote myself. I'm not looking for a job, anything like that. But I want them to know that, you know, what I'm up to, what I'm doing, I'm doing well or whatever. And I want to find out about them. And so I want to do that in a way that is comfortable for me. And so she's going to teach a class on that. And again, you know, I'm there because I want to maintain that contact. The other thing to remember about it feeling genuine is that it's it, it may think of the relationships as long term so they're not i'm not keeping in touch with this person because i expect to get something from them then now if they want something from me then a contact or information i'm happy to provide it but i'm not maintaining a connection with them because i expect them to give me something right away this is a long term investment in a relationship and so um but you have to maintain it over time i interviewed one woman for schmooze newsletter and uh for my schmooze newsletter and she said you know a former boss i kept in touch with for years, my husband and he, him and his wife, we would have dinner, you know, I'd reach out, ping him, you know, twice a year, something like that. Happy Thanksgiving. He ended up, you know, getting helping me to get my first board role. He became a CEO somewhere and he said, hey, would you be interested in being on the board? So the other way to not make it feel transactional is to realize this is a long term relationship. You're not having coffee with them or having a drink with them because you expect to get something from them tomorrow or tonight. You're doing it because it's a relationship. You kind of like the person. You have some things in common. And so it's an investment. It's an investment over the long Long term is another way to make it feel genuine and to to have it be genuine and not transactional. I think uh, one thing that uh, is also very true to many mothers, many parents, is the fact that quite often it's the children when they are born you go to school pick up them from school to school uh, other activities and uh, it turns out that. Uh, the parents of their friends become part of our network. How do we break the mold there? Because quite often uh, other parents are working in completely different fields. And how do we start conversation to make it not feel awkward and not just about being a parent? Yeah, so two things I would say to that. I interviewed one woman who said, oh, networking, and she's a CEO. And um, she had, and almost every woman I interview has had one co relationship that changed the trajectory of their career, a former boss, somebody internal. And what she said to me is she said, think of it as a community. You're building a community, not, oh, I'm networking. I'm building a community and everybody you're in touch with at work, in your industry, et cetera, should be part of your community. Those parents, those other soccer parents, they're part of your community. And one of the first schmooze classes, um, I just spoke to this woman the weekend who's going to be this weekend, she's going to be teaching it, is on um, the, um, the idea that the, uh, the weak ties in your community are sometimes more valuable than the people you know very well. So one of my best friends and I went to Columbia. We got our MBA together. I know if there was anything that Sharon could do for me, she's already done it. She helped me get my first job on Wall Street. Anybody she knows that can be helpful to me and vice versa, she's my best friend. So I've already, I already have her network, I know. But sometimes the people that you don't know as well are very, very, uh, even more valuable because they're not always thinking of you, but the, and, and you haven't already exhausted everything that they can do for you. So I know I've done everything for Sharon that I can do for Sharon, but there are probably people in her community, people she knows from her daughter's school, another parent, et cetera, who could be a connection with a connection with a connection. So what I would say is um, don't, it, there's nothing wrong with your community being or including, you don't want to exclude people at work because obviously, or people in your industry because they're very important, but there's nothing wrong with having a community that includes other soccer parents because you never know where your next 
job lead, et cetera, is going to come from. And very often it could come from someone that you don't know as well. So one of the first classes, if not the first class, mini master class that we have at Schmooze is with a woman who is going to talk about how you um, leverage the weak ties in your community. And again, those relationships feel, if you're concerned about feeling genuine, they feel genuine because you've been on the soccer sidelines together. And you know, if they called you to ask for something, you'd happily do. You're trekking their kids. They're trekking your kids back and forth to soccer games. If they called you and asked you for something career-wise, you'd probably happily do it and, and, and vice versa. So back to the transactional versus genuine, um, you know, don't disdain those contacts that you're making in the community. Mm. Don't disdain, uh, keep trying. However, for somebody who's shy um, and introverted, uh, there are unique challenges. Quite often they feel overlooked or discouraged from uh, speaking up when they know that, uh, you know, they don't have the, the same um, uh, tenacity in approaching people and, and getting their career uh, change they want. What would be your advice for a routine for somebody who is shy? How to practice coming out of the comfort zone for somebody who wants to network and build their career? Yeah, so look for there's a group out of Australia it's a women's, a professional women's organization. It's called Power Suit. And I think it's spelled P-O-W-R as opposed to P-O-W-E-R. Mm -hmm. um, Power Suit, they're on LinkedIn. She posted a great post yesterday about going to events when you're shy um, and how you can make that work for you. And I'm going to actually reach out to her and see, she, see if she would teach a class for the, the members of Schmooze. But she gave some great tips about how you want. I think her first one was you just insert yourself in a group and say, hey, I don't know anybody here. Can I join you guys? You just acknowledge the fact that you don't know anybody and you're shy. It's a huge pain point. Again, Schmooze is really about building relationships, not just about networking. But some of that building relationships starts with meeting some people at events. That's why LinkedIn is so wonderful, because you don't have to meet them at events. You can just meet them on LinkedIn. But some of those relationships that we're talking about building start with meeting somebody at an event. And those were always painful for me. When I was in business school, one of the ways you found a job was to go to these cocktail parties. So if you were interested in working at you know, in banking, you would go to Merrill Lynch's cocktail party, uh, companies that don't even exist anymore. Uh, and most of you are too young to remember Merrill Lynch, Shearson Lehman, et cetera. You go to their cocktail parties and you chit chat with their managing directors about your desire to work on Wall Street. And I couldn't stand it. They stressed me out to no end because I was a journalist before I went to business school. So what in the world was I going to talk to um, some senior guy at you know Goldman Sachs about when I'd never done a deal in my life? Like I hadn't traveled that much. I was very young. Like what were we going to talk about? So her, um, her advice was really, really helpful. Um, and I'm going to see if she will teach a class at the Schmooze Mini Master Class. What we try to do is three actionable takeaways that you can put into practice right away. Um, it's not an hour long. It's like a 20 minute long with a 10 minutes of Q&A. But um, she, I would really encourage you to look for that LinkedIn post because she offered some really good suggestions on how you, you know, go somewhere you know, these networking events. What I also try to focus on is uh, quality rather than quantity. So I'm not there necessarily to meet everybody in the room, but if I can come away with three or four people that I really got to know well, then I feel like that's a triumph for me. 
And for those who would like to build a similar network, Shelley, because we know that it is uh, quite easy to set up a website, uh, but really build connections and build, as you mentioned, community is a hard part because uh, many people come and gather to a place. They don't know each other. They don't want to talk, start conversation. And as a leader of a network, what is the most important role of, of the networker to make sure that an event is a success? Yeah, you want people to connect on a human level and not just, again, back to women not wanting to feel transactional. You want people to connect on a human level. Um, and one of the classes, another one of the classes that uh, will be available to Schmooze members will be taught by someone who has been very good about connecting with people on LinkedIn. I was amazed at the connections that she be, she she had been able to develop with people on LinkedIn over years. You know, she connected with them three years ago, had never met them in person, and now they're a connection. And, you know, so uh, that's one of the other schmooze classes that we will be doing. Um, it is helpful to connect with people on a human level. So if you don't want to talk about what's going on in the industry for some reason, or you have no idea, like I was as a student, I'm like, I don't want to talk about the industry. You know, one of the things, ask questions, because people love to talk. Like I'm here chatting my head off. Um, people love to talk. You can also ask personal questions, obviously not invasive, but hey, do you like to travel? What's the last place you've gone? What's on your bucket list in terms of places you want to go to? Um, do you like sports? What do you think about the Knicks? Um, that kind of thing. So connecting on a human or personal level. So somebody who just um, asked me to be on a board, um, we were on a board prior, uh, he and I together. And so in January, I just, you know, pinged him, sent him a text message saying, Happy New Year. And like two weeks later, three weeks later, he um, texted me, said, hey, are you interested in a board opportunity? I was like, absolutely. And so, um, but we kind of bonded over kids. My kids are adults. They're 26 and 30. His kids are toddlers or small, you know, under seven. And so he would send me Christmas cards with pictures of the kids. And they're so cute. And so I make it a point now when I talk to him to ask about the kids. I know what his wife does. She's a working mom. So I ask, you know, how's Winnie? What's she up to? How's the job going, etc. So again, that's another way that it's genuine and not transactional. Now, what I will say is back to that whole point, there are one or two board members that I've been on a couple of boards where I don't keep in touch with anybody, or there's certain people that I don't keep in touch with because we never connected on that human level. Now, having said that, if they call me and ask me for a reference to another board or something, I'm happy to provide it. So I still consider them part of my network, but they're not necessarily, you know, they're kind of on the outer ring of my network. Again, um, I consider it genuine because if they ask me for help, I would provide it. But I haven't, I didn't connect with them on a human level, and that takes it. Then you're much more top of mind. They think about you more often. Mm. You mentioned the fact that uh, quite often these recruiters are uh, not sure what your career goal is and you should approach these recruiters, making sure that they are on top of uh, what your aspirations are. However, I have to tell you, Shali, that so often I um, had uh, women telling me that recruiters don't even respond to their emails. What would you your advice be then? How to break that silence? Yeah, so I, um, you know, what I would say is I do not expect, especially after my career pivot, for recruiters to play a role if you're trying to pivot careers. So I wanted to leave Wall Street and go to investor relations. Investor relations is related and adjacent, but it was different than what I was doing before. I did not expect any recruiters to call me. I would lob in resumes, et cetera, but I didn't expect them. Recruiters want to make money. So they want to um, you know, represent people who have the background and the experience that they know 
that an employer is going to pay them for. So I'm trying to change careers. So they may not, I'm a long shot. So they are not going to be necessarily as receptive to my resume. They're probably not going to call me back and none of them did. So that's when you really need your network. That's when you have to know somebody who knows somebody because that recruiter is not going to be helpful. Again, what I would say is, look, Every time there's an opportunity, I belong to a lot of organizations that bring recruiters who specialize in board roles in to talk to us. If there's an opportunity to shoot them my resume, I absolutely do that. I try to connect with them on LinkedIn. But again, just like 80% of board roles are found through relationships, most jobs are as well. I don't have a stat for that, but I guess recruiters are one tool, but I really rely on my relationships. In addition to boards, I found all six of my board roles through relationships. I have to say in terms of my career, except for one job, I found every job I had through somebody who knew me in the industry. So um, I, I can't give any advice on how to break through with recruiters, send those resumes, continue to reach out. You never know. You know, I've gotten some board interviews through recruiters, but what I would say is, you know, you're more likely to get something through a relationship. More likely to get something through relationship, active listening, as uh, Shali gave us uh, some advice on how to uh, actually make that connection, take it to the next level by paying interest to uh, the family members uh, when you have a chance. So looking ahead, what are your aspirations for Schmooze and how do you envis envision it continuing to empower women in their careers and beyond? Because I think relationships are so critical, what I want is for women to become members of Schmooze. It's very reasonably priced uh, and take advantage of the many master classes. I am not a thought leader. So your people who establish themselves on LinkedIn as a thought leader, I am not a thought leader on building business relationships. That's why I started the newsletter and it's an interview format. So I interview women who have been very good. I never had anybody in my career to reach out to me and be my sponsor and be like, oh, okay, this is what you do. I interviewed one woman. She is the CEO of something called the Chicago Network. She's the one who talked about thinking of, about your network as a community. And she talked about, and several women have talked about, and if you uh, follow me today and you look at today's issue of my Schmooze newsletter, I uh, excerpt a quote from her as well as a couple of other uh, women who talked about how they connected with a senior person in their organization um, who then became a mentor, a sponsor, whatever, and changed the trajectory of their career. So what I really want to do is for women to be more aware of that to learn how to do that. Um, one of the pieces of advice that several women gave was to be curious, you know, and they talked about how you get the attention of somebody senior by being curious about the company, about the industry, about how you could do your job better. So I want women to be aware of it. I want women to, um, to use those tools because I don't think we close the gap on boards. I don't think we close the gap on women getting to the C-suite without us having those kind of relationships that change the trajectory of your career. I was on a call last night. I belong to a group called Black Women on Boards. And we had somebody on last night who is a, um, a CFO. Um, and she talked about how she had a boss who was like, look, I know you want to get an international assignment. I'm moving internationally. I want you to move with me. I think I've had one person in my career um, who has done that for me in 30 years. Um, and I think I would have had more if I had been more intentional about doing that. And so what I'm hoping for women and what I want Schmooze to do is have to encourage women and empower women um, to do just that. You mentioned uh, the fact that you need people who will speak up for you when you're not in the room. So yeah. how to make sure that they speak up for you when you're not in the room? Yeah, again, it's um, several women mentioned that work, work for them. And again, I'm not 
a guru on relationships. I am trying to relay information to women from women who are to women like me who needed it. Um, it's that relationship. So these women were curious. They you know, connected with somebody in the organization or in the industry that they didn't really know. And they were like, look, will you have coffee with me? And then they had a lot of conversations about, you know, the industry, about the job, about how they could do the job better. One woman said to me, look, I didn't want to waste this person's time. So I, and I didn't go in thinking I want a promotion. What I went in was really, you know, went into her office talking about how I could do my job better. She picked up on that. And then she recommended me for something that was a different role. I said no to the role. She was like, no, you're going to take this job. And she said, it changed my life. And so um, those are the kinds of moments that I want to see more women have. One last thing, and I know we're starting to run out of time, but I um when I worked at Chase Manhattan Bank, when we made merged with Chemical, most people don't even remember Chemical Bank, um, but we merged with Chemical, and there was a meeting of of everybody uh, with the very senior managers at at um, of the that were going to be the very senior guys in the organization, and um, it was anybody, everybody who was vice president and above. And I was the only woman of color in the room, only person of color in the room. But because of that, this senior guy knew who I was. And so he would see me in the elevator and be like, hey, Shelly. You know, I don't know if he knew all 300, other 300 people by name, but he certainly knew me. But I never figured out how to... I won't say take advantage of that, but build on that. Like I never popped into his office to have a conversation about deals or about how the bank viewed this or what our goals were, nothing like that. And so I want women to be comfortable. We have very few guys have a lot of opportunities. We have very few opportunities to leverage. And so I should have leveraged that. And I just had no idea how my parents were teachers. Nobody could help me. Nobody could tell me. Uh, even the boss who really was helpful to me, he wasn't much of an upward networker. And so I really want women to learn how to do that because, as I said, I think that's what's going to close the gap for us. And who is your role model in terms of networker? Is there somebody who you look up to thinking, oh, I wish, um, you know, I could have her career and I wish I had her attitude to network? There are so many, probably too many to name, um, but follow, subscribe to my newsletter. I interview a lot of them. And every time I interview somebody, I'm like, oh my goodness, she's amazing. So I don't want to leave anybody out. I would have to name like 25 or 30 women. Like I am, I've been so impressed with some of the women that I've interviewed with all of them, quite frankly, but there are so many um, so this issue of schmooze that I put out this morning, the newsletter, uh, I pulled some of the best advice from women that I've interviewed in the last couple of months. I did another one like this, my favorite quotes, a couple of months ago. But it, it pulls out some of the best advice and every single person had you know, some great advice. And part two is next week. So I don't want to name a particular person because all of them have been amazing and I've gotten great tips, tips that I wish I had earlier in my career. I would have gone so much further uh, had I talked to some of these women, um, you know, 20 years ago or 30 years ago. Well, Shelly, let's face it, one life, no regrets. So let's move on and schmooze our um, schmooze, to the future. <laughs> uh, schmooze to the future, schmooze through our conversation today. And here is a great quotation by Michelle Obama. The secret weapon of successful women is their unwavering support system. They will lift each other up, celebrate each other's wins and have each other's 
back and definitely uh, we can see that with many commenters who commented today uh rebecca bellamy the robles grace curry tyree orange ipov uh, that's patrick Catherine gackard um we definitely had great support today however let's go to another great role model who said uh, women are like tea bags we never know our true strength until we are put in hot water as eleanor roosevelt said so in life how are you in hot water shelly how are you brewing i'm doing better in hot water um i um finally feel like i'm in my sweet spot in one of the books that I uh, read that I wish, just like I kn wish I had known some of these women and gotten their advice when I started my career, was called The Big Leap. It's called The Big Leap by Gay Hendricks. And she talks about your zone of competence. So I am competent in uh, finance. She talks about your zone of uh, excellence. So I am a really good uh, writer. Uh, I was a writer before I went to business school and became a finance person. And I'm a really good teacher. Um, I, um, you know, I teach courses. I'm a really good teacher. But my zone of genius, which is what I need to be doing, is kind of what I'm doing now. So what I would say is I can't even describe this as hot water. Um, what I would say is what I'm brewing is schmooze. And I am having the best time of my life doing this. I feel like it's a calling um, and I am, I'm having the best time of my life. So I feel like right now I've found my zone of genius. Zone of genius of Shelly is upon us. So let's share some zone of life lesson quote. What is your life lesson quote and how did it change you, Shelly? So two for me. So most people are probably familiar with this Calvin Coolidge quote, which says nothing in the world can take the place of persistence. So he says, talent will not. Nothing is more common than unsuccessful men with talent. Genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. Education will not. The world is full of educated derelicts. Persistence and determination alone or omnipotent. And so for me, it's about staying the course. And the other one I had is actually a biblical quote. It's from Acts. And it says, I pitch my tent in the land of hope. And so in addition to being persistent, you can be persistent if you're very hopeful. And so I find because I'm now operating in my zone of genius that I have, you know, I have hopes for what I think schmooze will be. I have hopes for how my daughter's career will be different than my career and many more doors will open for her. And I'm passing on everything I'm learning from all of these amazing women. So the persistent and then also being hopeful. Hopeful. Those are my two life lesson quotes. Well, Shelley, uh, it's very uh, vital because you talk about education, how parents are obsessed with sending their children to good schools. And, uh, you know, you you uh, claim that it's not about education. It's all about networking. Why is that? Yeah, so I had this discussion, I think, with Patrick, and we talked about the whys of why parents are doing unethical things to get their kids into you know, certain schools. It's not about the education, even though USC and some of those schools are really good. They want their kids to be in that network. How many guys have you, you know, heard and said, oh, I got my, you know, I funded my startup because my roommate's father was rich and he gave me a million dollars. Like you want them to be in that network. So I went to a great school. What career I had after I graduated was totally due to the internships and et cetera that they had me, um, that they helped me to get. Yet. But what I would say, it was a small school on the East Coast. I was from New Orleans and the contacts and the relationships didn't transfer. Um, you know, I noticed my daughter who went to Syracuse and we live in the New York area runs it. And it's a bigger school runs into a lot more Syracuse alums. So if you're somebody on the West coast and, you know, USC is the place to be, you know, the great education, 
but it's not just at that point about the education. It's about the people you meet. Another one of my mistakes was, you know, I went to Columbia for business school. The CEO of Morgan Stanley was in my class at Columbia. I couldn't pick the man out of a lineup and he probably couldn't pick me out of a lineup. I didn't keep in touch with many people from business school. I thought I was there to learn and I was. I didn't know what present value was. I didn't know anything about finance, but I also should have been focused on whatever contacts and relationships that I was making. And so I think that's why those parents are doing what they're doing. It's not just about the quality of education. It's about the network that they want their kids to be in and the relationships they know that their kids can form at schools like that. Well, uh, at the final a question that we always ask uh, our guests, and it's about, uh, let's imagine you could meet anyone in the world for a private breakfast. Who would you invite and where would you go to, Shen? Yeah, so this was a tough one for me, and I couldn't think of anybody, quite frankly. But what it came down to is I would, it's multiple people. I would like to have breakfast. My parents have passed away. My grandparents have passed away. But if I could meet them again for a private breakfast, that's what I would want. And I would choose to meet at the house that I used to live in. So my husband, and I renovated this beautiful old Victorian. It sat way back from the street. So it had beautiful, what they call curb presents. And my parents really uh, my parents were teachers. They didn't have a lot of money, but they really poured into their kids and their parents had even less money. And so I would love for them to see what we, me and my siblings, have been able to accomplish because of their sacrifices, the schools that they managed to send us to, the things that they managed to instill in us. Uh, me and all my siblings have an entrepreneurial uh, streak. I don't know how that happened, but we do. And so I would want them. They've all passed away, but I would really want them to see, you know, this beautiful house that I used to own before I downsized. And I would want them to know that their sacrifices were worth it. Shelly, it's amazing that for somebody who wants to schmooze uh, through the network, you want to stay in your network and go back to your parents and grandparents. However, perhaps the secret, secret of living well is not in having all the answers, but in pursuing uns un unswearable questions in good company, as Elizabeth Lesser says. And that's it from episode 142 of PhD Livestream. Thanks to Shelley Lombard. Thank you very much once again for great comments. To stay updated and ensure you never miss Positivity Hack Delivered, follow Woman on it. And next week we have a guest, Nyla Beth Cowell. We're going to talk about empowering your tech journey interview uh, will be next Wednesday, the same time, the same place. Thank you so much to our lovely audience. As always, our positivity quote comes from positive thinking only and goes, look for something positive in each day, even if some days you have to look a little harder. Today is your day to hug the future, hug the positivity you want. Thank you. Thank you.